Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today, I'm going to begin a series titled Refuting Paul Onlyism. Or a subtitle could be In Defense of Jesus, John, and Peter. I. Uh, I remember I, I first started talking about this subject uh, back in October of 2010. So it's been over four years ago since uh, I started making some videos on this subject. And it's, I found it uh, as a subject or that is, um, has really been overlooked and neglected by much of the church or there's been an awful lot of tolerance or, or winking at it and just not uh, trying to make an issue about it, even though many saints I know have talked to me privately uh, and uh, voiced their concern and agreement that this is a, a problem, Paul onlyism. And yet I, I don't see anybody really addressing the problem. And uh, so I'm going to uh, take this on and do a very thorough refutation of Paul onlyism. Let me start off first by saying that um, those people who would fall under this category of Paul onlyists, uh, I do consider these people to be saints. Uh, I am not challenging their salvation. Uh, I accept them as brothers and sisters. Uh, I just believe that they are misled. Uh, I've, I've made a series uh, exposing uh, uh, Calvinism as a false religion cult. Uh, I've made videos exposing Roman Catholicism as a false religion and cult. In fact, the largest cult in the world. But I do not consider Paul onlyism to be a cult. Uh, I, I do consider it a, a serious problem. But uh, these people who are Paul onlyists, uh, I, I love them as as fellow saints, and that is not the purpose of this this uh, video and this uh, subject. So just as in other studies in the past, when I challenged the uh, a teaching, uh, I have to ask the question, well, why is it necessary to debunk or refute Paul onlyism? Well, let me, let me point out just a few things that will be discussed throughout this whole study here. And you'll understand, I think, why this is important. It's not a it's not a minor thing that should be just winked at and overlooked. Uh, the question is: Ask yourself this. Uh, and by the way, each of these points is part of Paul onlyism. So the question is: Should we exclude all scriptures except for Paul's letters? which is the, the books Romans through Philemon. Should they, all other scriptures apart from Paul's writings be excluded and diminished and, and uh, the importance of them uh, really just diminished and almost completely discarded and, and solely focus on Paul's letters? Um, can we get saved by reading the Gospel of John. What do you think? Do you think a person can get saved by reading the Gospel of John? Well, according to Paul Onlyus, you cannot. You can only get saved through Paul's writings. Now, the other question is, can, oh, thank you. The other question is, can we get saved by reading the words of Jesus. You know, 
some Bibles actually put all the words of Jesus in red letters. The red letters, the words of Jesus, if a person read those, can they get saved? According to Apollonius, you can't get saved by listening to Jesus. Now, they call themselves the right dividers. But I ask the question, are they really rightly dividing? I'm going to prove that they're not really right dividers at all. They're what I call over dividers. They talk about Paul's mystery. Well, what is Paul's mystery? I'll be going through that very thoroughly, and you'll find out that what Apollonius thinks Paul's mystery is, is completely wrong. Paul says clearly what the mystery is, and it's not what Apollonius is representing it to be. Uh, they consider themselves dispensationalists, but uh, uh, they would technically be called hyper-dispensationalists or ultra-dispensationalists. Hyper means you've taken something too far. They've taken dispensationalism to a new level, and that's such an extreme level, and that's why uh, they've excluded everything except for Paul's letters. That's quite extreme. That's overdoing it, overdoing their dividing, overdoing their dispensations. So we're going to look at what is a dispensation. And then we'll, we'll also look at, uh, there's what it, the scriptures call the gospel of grace, and also there's, in the scriptures, it says there's the gospel of the kingdom. Now, the question is, are these two different things? What are they? And are they two different things? Or is it one and the same? According to a Paul Onlyus, there are two different things, and only Paul preached the gospel of grace. He else preached the gospel of the kingdom, which is a different gospel. So the question is, did... Paul teach a different gospel than John, Jesus, and Peter, and others. Um, now, ask yourselves, are there two different ways of getting saved? According to Paul Onlyism, uh, you get saved, saved one way by reading Paul's letters, and if you, by, in doing it that way, you become a member of the church, the body of Christ. But uh, the other way of getting saved is through a different gospel. It's not the gospel of grace of all. It's the gospel of the kingdom. And that includes, uh, that's primarily for Jews. So the Jews get saved differently than Christians in Paul Onlyism, than, than Gentiles. Then we ask the question, was, was Paul unique? Uh, was, was he the only one that had this gospel of grace? Uh, and then what about, was Paul exclusive? Was he the apostle to the Gentiles? Was he the only apostle to the Gentiles? Was he even the first apostle to the Gentiles? These are things that we're going to be discussing and showing that Paulism has all these things wrong. And then I want to, I want to actually compare the actual teachings of the Apostle Paul, compare them with the prophets, compare them with Jesus, compare Paul's teachings with John and Peter. Because according to Paul Onlyism, Paul's teaching was unique and it was different than everybody else. So we're going to examine the teachings of Jesus, John, Peter, and the prophets and see if they disagree with Paul or not. So that's what I'm going to be discussing in this, and I expect this to be uh, quite a lengthy study. It will probably take uh, uh, quite a few episodes uh, and uh, many hours to get through it all, but I do believe it is important. Now, I'm going to quote just a something I found from uh, uh, Harry H. A. Harry Ironside, H.A. Uh, Ironside. He's a, considered to be a Christian scholar, 
He lived from 1876 to 1951. And he wrote an article refuting hyper dispensationalism many years ago. And this is what uh, Harry Ironside said about this subject. Quote, having had most intimate acquaintance with Bullingerism, as taught by many for the last 40 years, I have no hesitancy in saying that its fruits are evil. It has produced a tremendous crop of heresies throughout the length and breadth of this and other lands. It has divided Christians and wrecked churches and assemblies without number. It has lifted up its votaries in intellectual and spiritual pride to an appalling extent so that they look with supreme contempt upon Christians who do not accept views. Most instances where it has been long tolerated, it has absolutely throttled gospel effort at home and sown discord on missionary fields abroad. So true are these things of this system that I have no hesitancy in saying it is an absolutely satanic perversion of the truth, unquote. Well, that's, that's how H.A. Uh, Ironsides sees it. That's what he thinks of Paul onlyism. Uh, now, I, I'm not going to take it to this ex that extent. As I said in the beginning, I believe that these Paul onlyists are true believers. They're saved, uh, but they're misled. But the things that they, they teach are, have serious ramifications. But this, this has been my experience. Let me emphasize this part of what Harry Ryan said, said. It has divided Christians and wrecked churches and assemblies without number. They look with supreme contempt upon Christians who do not accept their peculiar views. That has been my personal experience with Paul Onlyus. Now, I've been on YouTube now for uh, almost eight years. And when I first got on YouTube, uh, it was partly my goal to, you know, make a lot of friends with fellow Christians, try to get along with everybody. And I found out that there was a large faction of Lordship Salvationists that I, I could not fellowship with because of that uh, serious heresy uh, and so I had to divide over those but I did find a, a group of people who were real grace believers uh, some of them became some of my best friends on YouTube uh, I'll mention one of them uh, brother Greg <laughs> if, if you're familiar with Greg you know who I'm talking about He's, um, to me, a very lovable, wonderful saint, uh, and at the same time, very tough and, and, and uh, uh, macho in his uh, style of preaching. Um, but he's a very adamant Paul Onlyist. And Brother Greg, he and I became very close. He was uh, following all my videos very closely giving me you know thumbs up or at that time i think it was five stars or whatever the rating was and he made actually two videos about me in my ministry he called it the videos tribute to sin city preacher uh, i was very fond of greg and uh and not only greg but a few others who were paul only us but the problem came about is that even though as I watched, I watched at least a hundred videos by Brother Greg and many other Paul Onlyists that I knew at that time. And as I learned about this teaching, I was very disturbed by much of it. But because I wanted to have peace and unity, I 
kept my mouth shut for probably I didn't didn't want to cause any kind of division or strife so I didn't speak out against Paul onlyism uh, even though I could see that it was definitely wrong but I gave him a pass because there were grace believers there free grace believers so they believed in uh, no works you required for salvation they believed in eternal security so I gave him a pass on all these other things that I saw as problems but what I found is that with brother Greg and with the others they would not give me a pass uh, whenever I happened to quote any scripture apart from Paul's writings if I quoted John 3 16 I would have Greg and others quickly point out to me you can't do that brother Luke it's only regarding salvation you can only quote Paul this happened to me over and over and over again telling me look brother Luke no one can get saved by reading the gospel of John because see I was highly recommending the gospel of John I, I've said many times that the gospel of John is my my favorite book in the whole Bible and they uh, they were they criticized me for that now, I'm not too sensitive about criticism I, I, I want to be criticized if I'm wrong and if I've actually been changed my mind on uh, a few uh, minor doctrines over the years because people have corrected me and I've listened um, so it's not like I'm overly sensitive but I did notice that it seemed like they that was their goal in life their their main uh, part of their ministry was to push this Paul onlyism on everybody and as Harry Ironside says it has divided Christians and wrecked churches it's very divisive for them to continually insist that you can't quote anything apart from the Apostle Paul if you're talking about salvation for us. Uh, and it's also very egotistical. As Harry Ironson says, they, they look with supreme contempt upon Christians, do not accept their peculiar views. So years ago, when I first realized there was a problem with this, I, I, I was doing my best to, you know, bite my tongue and not say anything. And, and, but then finally, finally, I decided that uh, Brother Greg had made at least 100 videos talking against the other scriptures and saying, only Paul, only Paul, only Paul. And so I felt I sh certainly should be able to make one video that is saying, no, uh, this hyper dispensation of this Paul onlyism is wrong. So I made a video expressing my viewpoint on it. And even though for a year or two, I was tolerant and tried to, to keep peace among everyone uh, by not making it an issue, as soon as I spoke out against Paul onlyism and said, this is what I believe. I believe you can get saved from the gospel of John. I can believe you can get saved from reading the red letters from the words of Jesus. Then uh, they, uh, the hyper B community, the Paul onlyists on YouTube, who are some of my very best friends, uh, all came against me. And there was this division against me because challenge Paul onlyism. So I found that what uh, Harry Ironstein says here in this quote I just read to be true, to, to be my own personal experience in dealing with uh, Paul onlyists. It's not my goal to uh, divide with them. It's not my goal to cause division and strife in the body of Christ. Uh, but I do want to stand up in defense of Jesus, John, and Peter. Uh, because in Paul only, their words are diminished. They're, they're insignificant. They're, you can't get saved by listening to them. So I want to defend them and stand up for them. And uh, 
if Apollonius, the big problem for me, I found is uh, I, I disagree with what they're saying. I could tolerate it if they would uh, uh, and, and have peace and fellowship with them, but they continually insist that this way of understanding the Bible dividing it rightly dividing it as they call it must be adhered to and uh, so that to me tells me that harry ironside was was correct that uh, they they look down with contempt for people who do not hold to this right dividing that they do uh, they they uh they divide the church by insisting on pole onlyism now uh, you know, you notice that uh, I'm calling it Paul onlyism. Why, why do I call it Paul onlyism? Uh, because it's it's the sh shortest, most accurate description of what it really is. Um, it's only Paul's letters when they say they rightly divide the scriptures. They're dividing everything else apart from Paul. So rather than calling it hyper-dispensationalism, ultra-dispensationalism, super-dispensationalism, or anything else so that could be not, uh, not as clear, to what does that mean? What is hyper-dispensationalism? Uh, I, I like the term paul onlyism because it tells you right away exactly what it is. Don't listen to anybody else except Paul. And that includes Jesus, and John, and Peter. So uh, let's look at, you know, so that you're, you're, you can Google the term hyper-dispensationalism and, and find tons of information about it, uh, but uh, I'm going to just read something from Wikipedia because Wikipedia is not trying to promote, it does, it's not biased. So let's what, see what Wikipedia says about hyper-dispensationalism. It says the uh, the grace movement, hyper dispensationalism, mid acts dispensationalism, ultra dispensationalism, or more rarely, Bullingerism, to which ultra dispensationalism properly applies, is a Protestant doctrine that basically views the teachings of the Apostle Paul both as unique from earlier apostles and as a foundational for the church. A perspective sometimes characterized by proponents as the Pauline distinctive. It goes on to say, <clears throat> hyper dispensationalism with E.W. Bullinger. Now he lived from 1837 to 1913. Um, with E.W. Bullingerism, Bullinger, an Anglican clergyman and scholar, being the best known early expositor of Acts 28 ultra dispensationalism. Although all dispensational ideas trace back further to John Nelson Darby from 1800 to 1882, J.C. O'Hare independently arrived at the mid Acts position after rejecting the Acts 2 position earlier on, and then the Acts 28 position later. Now, there's a lot of information in there, so let me go recap some of these main points. But uh, I want you to know that came from Wikipedia. It's not some theological uh, uh, writing that is uh, trying to support one viewpoint over another. It's just reporting the facts. And these are the historical facts of hyper-dispensationalism. So... Um, it's called a lot of different things, but basically it's, it boils down to this, as it says here, a Protestant doctrine that basically views the teachings of the Apostle Paul both as unique, as unique from the earlier apostles and as the foundation for the church. Um, then, now, what about uh, these different positions. You've got uh, Acts 2 position, you've got mid-Acts position, 
and X28 position. All of these positions are simply viewpoints as to when did the modern church actually begin? Because we know that we can go find the word church back in the Old Testament referring to is the believers of the Israelites who were believers were even referred to as the church. But the church, uh, as we know it today, because after Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection, when at what point did this church actually begin? And this is the, the dispute. Uh, Acts 2 position is the position that I hold, and that, uh, that the vast majority of uh, Christians and grace believers holds to. Acts 2 position is that uh, the church began at Pentecost, uh, when the Holy Spirit came into the congregation and filled them with the Holy Spirit, gave them power to do works, and they were sealed with the Holy Spirit. See, in, in previous times, Old Testament prophets and even some of the apostles be, while Jesus was alive, uh, they were filled with the Spirit in order to do some ministry works, uh, to do miracles. But it was only a temporary filling of the Spirit. They were not sealed as, as we are today. Christians today, when we, when we put in our faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit not only comes into us, but lives in us forever. We're sealed forever with the Holy Spirit. And so when did this first happen? It was the day of Pentecost in, in Acts 2. Um, so the, the vast majority of Christendom believe that the church actually started at that time, Acts 2 position. So mid-Acts tracks... Uh, mid uh position, they would that would be a uh, hyper dispensational position that the church started at Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus when Paul met Jesus, and that was the that experience when Paul became a believer. That's when the church began. So what they actually believe is that Paul was actually the first person to get saved. Paul was the first member of the church, the first member of the body of Christ. That's what the mid-Acts position uh, means. Uh, it also means that the other apostles weren't even part of the church. They, uh, before Paul got saved, Peter wasn't saved, John wasn't paid saved, Matthew wasn't saved, none of the apostles were saved. Only Paul got saved first on the road to Damascus. And I'll get talked later about the status of the other apostles and, and how they would have to get saved. But the point is, they believed that Paul was the first person to be in the church. And that happened on the road to Damascus. That's mid-Acts position. And that's a, a hyper-dispensation or Paul-only position. Now, mid-Acts, I mean, Acts 28 position, is even more extreme and Acts 28 position is a little bit more complex it says the church did not begin until Paul's imprisonment in Rome when God revealed it as a mystery this so-called mystery is said to be exclusively revealed in the prison epistles Philemon uh, Ephesians uh, Colossians and, and uh, Philippians there's those four epistles of Paul during that time when Paul wrote those in prison, that was the time that the church actually began when, when this new revelation of the mystery was what Paul started writing about. So uh, this is even an extreme form of hyper-dispensationalism where they think that the church didn't begin until uh, near the end of Paul's ministry. And it, they say prior to Acts 28, the ministry of Paul and the apostles consisted solely of kingdom and covenantal doctrine spoken since the world began by all the prophets. In other words, I'll go into this much more later because they think that the other apostles taught a different gospel than Paul. But they think that the apostle Paul actually taught a different gospel before Acts 28. So they think that before Acts 28, Paul and all the apostles 
taught a different gospel and that uh, the gospel of the kingdom, which is a, a faith not in the cross, but faith in Jesus establishing the millennial kingdom. So uh, these are the various positions. Uh, I think that if you're watching this now, the, unless you're a Paulonius, you probably hold to Acts 2 position. You've always thought that the church began at Pentecost. Some people think the church began at the cross, at the death of Jesus or at the resurrection. But we certainly don't think that the church didn't start until the Apostle Paul. Uh, so now, what did Paul say about about this? Or did, did Paul say anything about the church started when I got saved or the church started in, in uh, Acts 28? Well, let's look at Galatians 1. This is the Apostle Paul writing. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jewish religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church. So here we have Paul writing that before he got saved, he says, in times past, that uh, in the Jews' religion, that he, beyond measure, persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Paul is referring to back when he was Saul of Tarsus, when he was a Pharisee, when he was given... The, the legal charge and uh, responsibility of finding all of these uh, believers in Jesus, rounding them up, imprisoning them, and killing them. And he says, I persecuted the church of God. Now, Paul is calling these people that he persecuted the church of God. So if, if the church didn't exist until Paul got saved, or if the church didn't begin until Acts 28, when Paul was in prison in Rome, then why would the Apostle Paul say, before he got saved, he was persecuting the church of God? Well, so from Paul's own mouth, with his own pen, he re refutes this idea that the church began with his conversion, or the church began with his imprisonment in Rome. Now, I found that the Apostle Paul is so elevated by the Paul Onlyus. Uh, he's given the stature, basically, of that is unparalleled, uh, except for the only comparison I can give would be a pope. That's how much Paul is venerated by the Paul Onlyus. So I would say... The question is, is Paul the Pope for Paul Onlyus? Let's look at a few verses and see what, try to determine what his actual status is and, and should be. Now, let's, first, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4. And, I, and the question is, is this verse the beginning of Paul Onlyism? Is this when the idea of Paul onlyism first got started? 1 Corinthians 3, verse 4. For when one says, quote, I follow Paul, unquote, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. So here we have the first letter to the Corinthians, Paul addressing the problem he sees in that some believers were esteeming men, apostles, uh, esteeming them beyond what they should be esteemed. And he's, he's, he's telling us, basically, you should not be identifying yourself as a Paulist or a Apolloist or a Calvinist or a Lutheran. 
or anything that, that has a man's name on it. Paul was a man. He should not be elevated to the status that you identify yourself with Paul. You should be identified with your Savior God, Jesus Christ. That's why we call Christians. We identify with Christ. So we can see that at this time already there was a problem. Some people identifying themselves with Paul, and, and he wanted to put a stop to that right there. Now, another verse that refers to this problem is 1 Corinthians 11, 1. And that is, be ye followers of me, is it even as I also am of Christ. I've had Paul Onius, you know, send me this verse to justify that we're supposed to be following Paul. Uh, not Jesus. We don't follow Jesus. We follow Paul according to Paul Onius. Well, um, the problem with that is that when you take a verse out of context, uh, it, it, you can come up with a terribly wrong conclusion. There's a saying that a verse out of context is a pretext. In other words, you can, you can purposely mislead people and, and deceive people and, and to lead them down the, to a wrong conclusion by pulling a verse out of context and misrepresenting what it really means. Now, for you, Paul Onlyus, I want to show you what 1 Corinthians 1, 11, 11, 1 actually means. Uh, well, that, I read it in KJV. Let's look at it. Uh, he says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. That's KJV. Uh, it says, Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. NASB. He says, It says, Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. NIV. So, what is he referring to? Is he saying that we don't follow Christ? But we we follow him. He he's our apostle. We follow him. That's what a Paul Onlyus would tell you. But let's look at it in context. If you study this verse in context and you look at what commentators normally say about it, it says they most commentators teach that First Corinthians eleven one must be understood as the conclusion to chapter ten. So this is chapter eleven, verse one. Now, we know that punctuation in the scriptures is inserted by men. It was not in the original writings. There was no punctuation. There was also no chapters in, in the originals. Men divided it into chapters. Uh, there were no verse numbers like chapter 11, verse 1. None of that was in the original scriptures. So, our... It, it, it should really be better, it's better understood if we look at verse 11, I mean chapter 11, verse 1, as actually the last verse of the chapter 10, as far as the content of the subject. So let's look at a few verses in the context here. Chapter 10, starting with verse 23, the Apostle Paul says, I have the right to do anything you say. But not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. I'm referring to the other person's conscience, not yours. For why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, 
Do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. I'm going to read that last verse again, because he's summing up this whole thing, this idea that we're free to eat and drink, and we have this freedom, uh, and that uh, we shouldn't judge other people if they're not eating the same things as us. So that's the subject, and he says, he's doing this, even as I try to please everyone in every way. So he's doing this because he wants to please everyone. He says, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many. So, so he's telling people, look, this is how I deal with this because I want to get along with the people because I want to have a chance to witness to them. And so, as like he said, I become all things to all people. And he, he, he says, I am not seeking my own good but the good of many. He, he's, he's compromising here in order so that many people, can ears could be open and they'd actually be willing to listen to him so that some can be saved. And then this should be the end of it. Be followers of me is even as I also am of Christ. So he's saying, do this same thing. This is the way you should conduct yourself dealing with this particular problem. People judging each other for what they're eating. Uh, for uh, unbelievers inviting you to a meal, uh, eat whatever you uh, was put before you without raising questions. Uh, so that's the subject that this verse is uh, applies to. Uh, and he's saying that he, he compromises so that he can uh, have an opportunity to witness to people. And he says, be followers of me. In other words, f follow my example. Do the, treat people the same way regarding this particular subject. He's not talking about being followers of him as being his disciple in terms of, uh, you know, as they, the Paul Onlyus wants to represent that Paul is our apostle and, you know, we follow him. We don't follow Jesus. Even as I also am of Christ. So that's the verse that they love to use to show that we're not, we don't follow Jesus. We follow Paul. But Paul just says that in reference to this one particular thing, saying this is the way I'm doing it. This this is the way I suggest you do it too. This is the way you handle this problem. Now, the, um, the Paul Onius, they, they really have a what I would call a slogan. And it's uh, taken from 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 15. Let me read that. KJV says, Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, uh, most of you, if you if you studied this scripture as much, you're very familiar with this verse, uh, this charge to us to rightly divide the word of truth. What does rightly divide the word of truth mean? Is what we have to figure out here. And But the Paul Onlyus, have taken this verse and making it their their slogan, their mantra. They always refer to you must be a right divider. They call themselves the right dividers. You, you must rightly divide. Trying to correct everyone else who's not a Paul only is saying, you're not rightly dividing. Well, what they're doing is they're over-dividing, dividing Paul apart from everything else and separating Paul's t uh, letters as the only thing that matters. Now, but let's look at this. Uh, I, I was a KJV only for many years, uh, but I find it very helpful to look at other translations. And, and so let's, let's look at this same verse. NIV says, do your best to present yourself to God 
as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth. Now, rather than rightly dividing, this says correctly handles the word of truth. Now this, in the NIV, compared to the KJV, is one of the main reasons that I have never met a single Paul onlyist who is not also a KJV onlyist, because this term of rightly dividing uh, is in the KJV, but we don't see it in, in the modern translations. It's, it's different. They need the term rightly dividing because that is that term is what they use to justify by dividing and separating everything apart from Paul. Uh, but is it, does it really mean to divide? Or does it mean to handle the scriptures correctly? To learn. Uh, yeah, someone there? Yeah, it's me. Hey, brother, how you doing? Welcome. Good night, yourself. Have you been listening at all? Uh, I've just joined. I've just really um, joined you when you were talking about um, Paul's MP follows me as I am of Christ. You were talking about how oh. um, eating food and stuff like that. Okay, well, you, uh, as I'm doing this study here, uh, you feel free to respond to anything I've said here. Uh, I, the, the question is, you've missed a lot if, you've, uh, if you haven't watched it from the beginning, but the idea I'm presenting here is that there's a faction of Christians that believe that uh, we cannot get saved by reading the words of Jesus. We cannot get saved by reading the Gospel of John. We cannot get saved any other way except through the writings of the Apostle Paul. And that's the, that's the uh, position that I'm refuting today. Uh, but now I'm on the point where I'm discussing uh, rightly dividing, and I'm comparing it in the various translations. So in KJV it says rightly dividing the word of truth. In NIV, it says correctly handles the word of truth. And then in LT, it says correctly explains the word of truth. NASB says accurately handling the word of truth. Now, uh, I don't know, Brother Dean, are, are you a KJV onlyist or you prefer it? Or what, what is your preference on Bible translations? Um, preferably, my preference is um, the King James Version. Um, I've tried the New Jerusalem Bible before, but it didn't look good to me. Like so, mm -hmm. I mean, well, I was a KJV onlyist. I was adamant. I've studied it thoroughly, and I promoted it, and I taught it for many years. And then a few years ago, I was persuaded that uh, it's it's I shouldn't be KJV only. Uh, right now, I'm probably a KJV preferred. I always read the KJV, and then whenever I come to verses that I think it might be helpful, I look at uh, modern translations. I look at Greek. I'll try to, anything that can help me to understand it better. So I'm not KJV only, but I found that uh, sometimes modern translations or the Greek can be helpful. And in yeah. this case, it can be very helpful. You can see that in this verse, the Paul onlyists, they call themselves the right dividers. I don't know if you've encountered any of these people. Dean, are you familiar with the people I'm talking about who are telling you that you can't quote the Gospel of John? You better just stick only with Paul? Um, I'm, sure you, I'm sure you've heard of Greg. Yeah, I referred to Greg earlier. I, I know Greg quite well. I was talked about him earlier in this. Yeah, you know Greg then? Yeah. Okay, how many of his videos have you seen? Well, I think a few of his videos. They're usually just... Um point out the right division study, you know, like that, you know. Just okay, I've, uh, I've, I've watched more than a hundred of Greg's videos and, 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 and many others that, that are like Greg. And I'm very, very, um, uh, very much understand what they're teaching, just that I don't agree with it. And so we had a division over this, this particular problem here. But now I'm looking at this verse here, and you can see that, in the KJV, it says rightly dividing, and this is very important because every single Paul onlyist is also a KJV onlyist, 
And one of the reasons is because they need to use the term rightly divide, because rightly dividing means that they can divide all the other scriptures away and say, we're only left with Paul. That's what, that's what we, we stick with, only Paul. But I'm going to look at it in the Greek and see if the Greek agrees with KJV or does the Greek agree with one of these modern translations I just read. And in the Greek, in Strong's Concordance, reference 3718, uh, it says the Greek is translated as accurately handling. So mm -hmm. the NASB would be the one that actually uses the Greek words. So, so let's go with that. It says, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Now, if what is the difference between accurately handling the scriptures versus rightly dividing the scriptures? Is there, is there something that you can see that is um, important between using the words handling it and dividing it? Um, not really. I think when it says correctly handling the word of truth, I think you do that by rightly dividing the word of truth. Yes. Can you see, though, by, by using the word dividing, they can try to use that to justify the divisions? Yeah. You know, uh, um, in dispensationalism, there are divisions. Uh, di some dispensationalism, they divide the time into seven time periods. Uh, Hyper-dispensationalism, they have their own way of dividing, but they divide what I call, the reason they call it hyper, you know, it, here's my arm and my elbow. If I extend my joint to a certain point, it doesn't want to go any farther. If I hyperextend my elbow, it'll break. Hyper yeah. means you've gone too far. <laughs> you've taken it too far. And what they do with hyper-dispensationalism, they've taken dispensationalism to a new level, and they've gone so far that they've excluded everything. They've excluded Jesus' words. They've excluded the Gospel of John. They've excluded the Apostle Peter. Nobody matters except Paul. And that's yeah. why it's called hyper-dispensationalism. And that's why this, this term, rightly dividing, is so important and critical to them. They call themselves the right dividers. I call them, so, I call them the over-dividers. They've gone too far. They're over-dividing the Word of God. Okay. Um, now, uh, let's, let's look at what really is the correct dividing point in the scriptures. Um, now, uh, I, I'm not, I, I have another playlist, brother, that is uh, quite thorough talking about dispensationalism, millennialism, or the rapture, the tribulation, and all that stuff. And it's very, very thorough discussing the whole concept of dispensationalism. I'm not going to go into the whole uh, subject because uh, I, that's not really what I want to focus on today. Uh, but I, I want to talk about um, what I think is the correct dividing point in the scriptures. I believe there's one key dividing point, and and that is the dividing that we see when uh, the, 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 you, you look at any Bible, and it's right there in front of you, right under your nose. There's the Old Testament, mm -hmm. there's the New Testament. You can see that there's a dividing point there, the Old and the New. Also, in the scriptures, as we study the verses, you find out it's also called covenant. You have the old covenant and the new covenant. This is an obvious thing that's right there on the Bible. Uh, it's, it's, it's like right at the very beginning of every Bible, it says Old Testament, and then at a certain point it says New Testament. Yep. So that is something that nobody can dispute. There is a dividing point there. Uh, but the question is, uh, all could remain in, is where does the Old Testament and the New Testament begin? I talked earlier about the, the, when did the church begin. In Hyperdes, they say the church began uh, when the Apostle Paul got saved. I talked about that before you joined me, brother. Yeah. Uh, they believe the church not be, did not begin until Paul got saved. That means that Peter wasn't in the church, John wasn't in the church, Matthew wasn't in the church, Peter, Paul was the first one. Some of them go so far as to say the church didn't begin until Acts 28 when Paul was in prison writing his prison epistles. That's super dispensationalism. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, I, I believe the church uh, began in Acts 2 at Pentecost, and I, I, I covered that earlier in this study. 
But let's look at a couple of verses now and see what we we can conclude here. If we look at Hebrews 9, verse 15, I'll start there. And it says, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the trans under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with, with Hebrews in chapter 9, but uh, what's your reaction to what I just read, brother? Um, Martin, being honest with you, um, the Testament must be also to the death of the testator. Well, I mean, the death of the Old Testament, I, for me, ended properly when Jesus resurrected from the death. I mean, that was the beginning of the New Covenant, New Testament, and I think, um, yeah, um, I, I told you something there, and that's that would be the death of the testator. Which is Christ? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you said at the resurrection, and I wouldn't challenge that. That's three days, three days difference. But according to Hebrews 9, it, it talks about the death. It doesn't talk about the resurrection at this point as far as the, the, the testament. And it, this, if this is writing is using an interesting uh, comparison because... Uh, um, do, you have, do you have a will? I know you're a pretty young man, but did you ever write a will? No. Well, I have a will, and it's called uh, uh, the Will and Last Testament. And your, your will and last testament uh, is uh, the final thing so that when you die... Now, I have a will right here in my drawer, and, uh, but it, it, everything I put in that will doesn't have any force right now. Because I'm alive. Yeah. It says in verse 14, 17, it says, For a testament is of force after men are dead. Uh, otherwise, there's no strength at all while the testator liveth. So my, my last will and testament is, is not in force right now. When I die, at that moment, it goes in force. That's when it applies. And so this is telling us that when Jesus died on the cross... That's when this testament began. Uh, now, when he raised himself from the dead three days later, that was the sign of Jonah. You know, Jonah and the whale? Yeah. yeah, do, you remember, yeah. do you remember when the, the Jews were demanding a sign from Jesus and what he said to them? I, uh, you know, something some, some about you know, the sign of the prophet Jonah or something like that? Yeah. Now, Jesus had already done all these miracles in front of everybody for you know, for years, and they were familiar with all these miracles, but they were demanding a sign, and he said, no sign will give, be given to you except the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Yeah. So Jesus called this, referring to his death and burial and resurrection, and he was referring to it as the sign that they that he would give them and give us. This is the sign for all of us to tell us who he is, and what he did, and that he, that he has the power of life and death. So uh, that's the point of the resurrection. It proves that he is God and he has the power of life and death. And by understanding about him raising himself from the dead, I can have confidence in him and say, okay, I'm justified in putting my faith in him because he proved that he does have power of life and death. So, but this verse in Hebrews 9 is telling us the New Testament starts at his death. Um, however, uh, uh, the, in my Bible right here, it says the New it says New Testament, and it starts off in it's Matthew. Yeah, beginning Matthew. with. Uh, let me see what it says in the very first verse. Uh, Matthew, Matthew 1, 1. Where is it? Okay, Matthew 1, 1 says, The book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. But it says, 
right here, the cover page says, look, the New Testament, right? So most people think the New Testament starts with Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. But as, as you and I just discussed, the New Testament doesn't begin until the death on the cross, right? Yeah. So everything in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that is, is, is while Jesus is alive, is really Old Testament stuff. It, the, the test it, it doesn't go into effect. It doesn't go into force until he dies. Yeah. Okay? Uh, so that's the important thing to understand there. Um, so that's the dividing point. The dividing point is the cross. Uh, in the Old Testament, everybody was look, looking into the future for this cross, this death, this blood sacrifice, this, this, uh, this thing that God would do to redeem the world. They all look forward to it. And now you and I look back at the cross and say, it's finished. We believe it's finished. He accomplished uh, what he came to do. He paid for our sins, and now we get eternal life because of our faith in that. Yeah. So um, that's the importance uh, of understanding what the, the, the dividing point is. Brother, this is the only dividing point that I can see in the scriptures that I believe is separates us as far as dispensations. The, the, the old dispensation or the old covenant, uh, the Old Testament, was looking forward to their Redeemer coming, and now the, the New Testament, we look back and say, He did come, it's Him. Yeah. Now, uh, you and maybe other people, I know Brother Jackson, he believes in seven dispensations, but he believes that there's only people only got saved this one way throughout history, and that is because of faith. Uh, he does not believe that people got saved through works any time in history, but he believed that there were dispensations in terms of how much information God gave them. We're going to discuss that more as we go along. But do you have anything to, to talk about this New Testament and the dividing point that I just uh, was, was talking about? Um, no, I've, I've said what I have to say. Okay. Uh, now, uh, here's the problem I have with some dispensationalists, whether they are just a regular dispensationalist, like uh, Dr. Peter Ruckman, who I've studied extensively. I have about, you know, 40 of his books. Uh, or, or, uh, whether, or whether it's Brother Greg or Les Feldick or any of these hyper-dispensations, these Paul Onlyists, uh, they believe that not only uh, in this, these other dispensations, but they believe that people get, got saved differently in the past and they get saved differently in the future. Uh, and that only today do we get saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. This they call the, the age of grace. So the, the, some distant believes it's always been grace alone and faith alone for salvation. Uh, but many dispensationalists that I'm familiar with, they believe that in the past people had to do, have faith and works. And uh, hyper-dispensationalists believe that in the past it was faith and works, and in the future, after the rapture, that it'll be faith and works. So that is a very important distinction. But I, I believe that it has always been by grace alone, through faith alone, uh, period. And, and I made a series of videos called uh, The Bloody Trail. And in that series, I probably spent about 10 or 12 hours showing from Genesis 1-1 all the way through the scriptures all of the examples of pictures of Jesus' blood sacrifice like uh, the animal being slain and covering Adam and Eve like like Cain sacrificing an animal and God it was, God was pleased but uh, Abel I mean Abel sacrificed the animal but Cain's sacrifice was uh, the works of his hand and he, God didn't approve of it uh, and, and like uh, Moses holding up his arms and, and uh, like the, the, the cross and, and uh, he had to have two people hold his arms up just like there were two a person on each side of Jesus at the cru crucifixion uh, like J Joseph being buried in the in the uh, 
in the uh, in the well and coming out of the well like the death and resurrection. And over and over again, we have all these Old Testament pictures and shadows of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And even in Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22, it goes into great detail explaining the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus for our sins. So uh, I believe that we see this throughout all the scriptures, and I've documented this very, very carefully in my series, the bloody trail. Now, what about the law in the past? Some people are teaching that you had to do some works in the past, but I'm, I'm claiming that the law uh, was never intended to be part of a salvation formula. A salvation in the past has always been through faith alone. Faith in God to, to be the Savior. Faith in God to save them. But the difference is how much information we knew. No. Um, the, and Adam and Eve didn't know the name Jesus, did they? But they knew that God would pro provide salvation for them. Uh, all the other prophets, they, they didn't know. Uh, as uh, Gradually over time, through the scriptures, through the prophets, more was revealed, more knowledge was dispensed, and uh, they understood more. But it was always faith in God to provide salvation, not rather than faith in their own works. Uh, now, are you, do you have uh, any disagreement with that basic premise? Because I've got some scriptures I'm going to use to, to prove that case in a minute. Um, no, not really, because if you look at Abraham and Lot, they, they lived before the law as well. And in Galatians 3, um, Paul even says that the law was a schoolmaster to bring us on to Christ. But once we're on the Christ, we're no longer under the schoolmaster, so I have no disagreements now, no. Yes. Okay, brother, good. Those are good examples. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Hebrews 11 is called the the faith chapter because it, 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 it is all about faith, and it shows you all these Old Testament characters who were saved by faith, not by works. So, uh, but let's go look at some of this because there are people who are teaching that in the past faith and works to get saved and this is part of Paulonism, of hyper dispensationalism they believe that in the past people had to do works and it's a different way of getting saved so let's look at and examine that Deuteronomy 620 it says uh, in the future this is uh, Moses writing this by the way he's saying in the future when your son asks you, quote, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord our God has commanded you? That's a very good question, isn't it? He says, in the future, that's right now. And this is the question we're asking right now. What is the meaning of the stipulation, decrees, and laws the Lord our God has commanded you? We're asking now that same question. What was the purpose of the law when it was given to to Moses. That's the question he asked right here. And Moses says, tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes the Lord sent signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household, but he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land he promised on oath to our ancestors. Verse 24, I'm underlining, it says, the Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God so that we might always prosper and be kept alive, as is the case today. So, uh, here, Moses is posing the saying, in the future, people are going to be asking, why did God give us the laws? And he says, right here, he answers the question, uh, he commanded us to obey all these decrees so that we might prosper and be kept alive. There's nothing in there about how that by following the Ten Commandments or the 613 laws, the, the purpose of it was to get to heaven. It was so that they would prosper and be kept alive. Uh, are you familiar with that verse and that, that point, Scripture, brother? Um, no, I wasn't actually um, aware of that scripture. Um, it just—it's a 
Jesus even said himself, about the law, you know, it's like um, when he was rebuking the Jews, you know, he was saying, love the Lord like God, all your heart and mind, love your neighbor as yourself. This is the fulfillment of the law and all the prophets. So it's pretty good laws to live by, like, but they're not necessary for salvation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, brother. Uh, now, I'm just giving this one example. This is Deuteronomy 6.20 through 6.24. Uh, I could, if I wanted to, I could give several more examples uh, in uh, Exodus and, 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 uh, and Deuteronomy uh, that make the same case. But the point is, it says that what the purpose of the law is. The purpose of the law was not to get anybody to heaven. The purpose of the law was so that if they follow the law, God would bless them. He, they keep keep them alive and make them prosperous. So people are have been misusing the law and thinking that the God gave the Jews the law so that if they follow the law, they go to heaven. But that's not what the scriptures tell us. It's only so they'd be blessed and kept alive. Now another example of this is in Joshua 23. I'm going to read verse 15 and 16. It says. Quote, it shall come about that, that just as all the good words which the Lord our, your God spoke to you have come upon you, so the Lord will bring up you from off this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Verse 16 is the important part here. It says, when you, you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, then the anger of the Lord will burn against you, and you will perish quickly from off the good land which he has given you. So he, he, this is telling us that if they do not follow the commandments, that they're going to be punished by losing their land. So uh, it doesn't say they're going to go to hell if they, if they don't follow the commandments. It says that they will lose this land that they've gotten, and so you, you got in Deuteronomy saying so that they will uh, prosper and be kept alive, and in Joshua it says if that if you if you don't keep the commandments you're going to lose the land. So now we we can see that uh, the this the law was never given us for the purpose that people are misusing it trying to trying to justify themselves and go to heaven. Um, now let's look at what Paul said about this. Galatians 3, verses 6, uh, 7, and 8. It says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in, th in thee shall all nations be blessed. Some very important things in those verses, brother. Uh, of course, the, the points I'm trying to prove here is that uh, uh, man was not saved by works in the past, and the gospel that, uh, that, that we have that we save by our faith is, is uh, not new. Uh, that it says here, Abraham believed God. His faith is what uh, what justified him. And then it says that foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham. In other words, he's preaching the gospel even back to Abraham, saying, "In thee shall all nations be blessed." So. Um, you can see that uh, this is showing that the idea of getting saved through the law is wrong. It, it never was intended to save anybody. And the idea of being saved by the grace of God through faith is not new. Paul did not introduce it. It was back even in Abraham. It says the gospel was preached unto Abraham. All right, brother, what's your response to that? Oh yeah, I mean that's very true. Um, the best where it says all nations shall be blessed. Obviously, it's coming spiritually. Spiritually, um, obviously Abraham is like the God of Abraham as in Jacob. It's from if, if Matthew one, it's from the 
he's, he's in the lineage of the Jesus seed. And obviously mm-hmm. now have Jesus who will offer him. All nations have been blessed. You know, free faith alone in Christ. So it's something so mm-hmm. for a that. Amen. That's that's the significant part of that final verse there. All nations will be blessed. How will we be blessed? Not with uh, you know uh, great financial rewards. Not with uh, health. Not with land. We'll be blessed because this uh, seed of the woman that was promised to Adam and Eve. This promise that was uh, become through Abraham's seed uh, is the Messiah. Well, all all nations are blessed because. Through Abraham, this Messiah, this Savior, this Savior God, Jesus Christ, would be born through his family line. Amen. Uh, okay, so now, so the conclusion I want to make here is that uh, we looked at Moses' sayings, and Moses said the, the law uh, was so that people could prosper and be kept alive. What Jesus said about the law I'm going to go into more detail later, but Jesus is saying that the law, or the purpose of the law is to, it, it is impossible to follow. But once we understand it's impossible to follow, we'll understand that we need God to save us instead of trying to do it on our own. Paul said the purpose of the law was it was a schoolmaster to teach us that our need for Jesus. So we see that never was the law by Moses, Jesus, or Paul used to say you can work your way to heaven if you follow the law. That's the important thing to understand. Never was that the case. So people who are teaching that in the past people went to heaven because they were able to uh, have faith and do, and do good works is wrong. It's Works have never worked. <laughs> I love that saying. We know that works don't work right now. You know, a person cannot go to heaven today because of their works. Right, brother? I agree with that, yeah. Okay. And I, and I just showed that in the past, works wouldn't work. You, can't yeah. go, you couldn't go to, to heaven in the past because of works. And yeah. some would claim, well, you can have to use works in the millennial kingdom or in the tribulation. Works will matter then. And, you, and, I, and I say, no, works never work. We always need to rely on God to save us and never use our own works to justify our salvation, past, present, or future. But that's what the dispensationalists, um, uh, Jackson has argued with me that, you know, there, there are some dispensationalists like him that, that believe it's always been faith alone uh, for salvation. Um, and... and uh, but I don't consider those people to be what I understand as real dispensationalists, uh, and they're certainly not hyper dispensationalists. The Paul onlyists do believe that uh, in the past people got saved by faith and works, and in the future people get saved by faith and works. Only now do they get saved by grace, because this is the age of grace, and it's only through the Apostle Paul. All right, brother. Now we're going to talk about the mystery. No, oh, the mystery. This one. Yes, the mystery is really very, very clear because Paul actually tells us exactly what the mystery is. And you know what I find mysterious? That the Paul onlyists don't understand what the mystery is. They're misrepresenting the mystery. They're telling everybody that the mystery is something entirely different than it really is. And we can prove it simply by just li- listening to what Paul says the mystery is. And we find this in Ephesians chapter 3. And let's read verses 1 through 10. Okay? When, Tell me when you've got it ready, brother. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1 through 10, yeah? Yeah, okay. Now, now this is Paul writing Ephesians verses 3, chapter 1. Chapter 3, verse 1. For, for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, uh, if of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, wherefore, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. 
which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now I'm going to stop right there because uh, uh, this, this is the point where the Paul onlyists don't, don't want to go any further for some reason. They, Paul onlyists teach that the mystery is that uh, in times past, people didn't understand that there would be the, this age of grace. That they, they didn't understand that somehow they wouldn't have to work for salvation anymore. That, that, that they, God would give them grace and through faith in Jesus, they would get saved. And that was a mystery. People didn't understand that in the past. But that's not what the mystery is. Paul says next in verse 6, that, that means this is what the mystery is. He's talking about the mystery, and then he says, the mystery is that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So Paul is telling us here in verses 1 through 6 what the mystery is. The mystery is not that now people can get saved without works. It's faith alone. That was not the mystery. The mystery was that the Gentiles would be included. And that's why James and the church in Jerusalem were shocked when Peter reported to them that, that, that he went to see Cornelius and he and Cornelius and his family all got saved and, and they, they were shocked. They didn't know that the Gentiles would be included. They, they thought it was this whole thing was all about Jews and no Gentiles would ever be part of it. And that was the mystery, Paul says, that was revealed to him, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. I'm going to read the rest of it in a minute, but let me get your reaction to that part, brother. Um, yeah, I mean, that's actually new to me as well. Um, I thought I'm used to hearing people saying the mystery was like the um, rapture. Hmm. The rapture, huh? Yeah, that's what I've heard. Like. That's interesting. Uh, I've never heard of the, the rapture being referred to as the mystery, but they call it the secret rapture. Uh, so maybe in that way they use, maybe it's a different mystery that they're referring to, but the, the Paul's mystery has, has been always this, that the, 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 the Gentiles will be included, but the Paul only is say the mystery is that it's going to be faith alone. But yeah. the rapture, that's another totally different uh, subject and, and, and uh, question. And that is, is the rapture secret? If you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, then you believe that in the secret rapture, that it happens and that uh, it's not seen. Uh, people just disappear. The left, everybody's left behind. And, uh, and then the second coming comes later. If you believe in the... Uh, another viewpoint is that the rapture and the second coming are simultaneous, then you don't believe in the secret rapture. It's all happening at the same time and it's seen. So, uh, but that's a totally different subject we can talk about some other time. All right, now let me read the end of this. Um, uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7 through. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me whom am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God which who created all things by Jesus Christ. So the important thing to understand from this is that the, the mystery uh, that Paul is referring to, that he's revealing, is that Jews, you thought that th this salvation, this Messiah, was coming only for the nation of Israel. But he came for Gentiles too. The whole world is part of this, Jews and Gentiles. That was a mystery before. Now you know that it's Jesus is for everyone. And so he's going among the Gentiles to tell them, you're included in this too. You know, we thought it was only for Jews, but now I know that you're included. So he went to the Gentiles. Now, there's another thing that we need to address in this, and that's this 
use of this word dispensation. In verse 2, it says, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God. So the word dispensation is greatly misused and misunderstood, I found. Uh, well, um, we don't get our theology necessarily from dictionaries, but, but it can be helpful to see what a dictionary says about a word. What does a word actually mean? And I looked up the word dispensation in the dictionary. It has a lot of different definitions. But one of the definitions says, the act of dispensing. Dispensing. Now, let's say that, brother, I have, I have uh, uh, 10 ears of corn. And, and, and I want you to have one of the ears of corn. I want Brother Greg to have an ear of corn, too. And, and, and I want several other people we know to have ears of corn. But I, I have all the corn. Well, when I give one out to you, I've dispensed it to you. I've given it out to you. I've given you this corn. Um, so that's what dispensing is, is to give out something. And so dispensation means the act of dispensing. Now, what is being dispensed? Uh, I believe there's two things being dispensed. One is grace. Uh, grace has always been dispensed throughout history. Abraham received grace in the eyes of God, right? Abraham received grace. Yep, definitely. Now, now we know we know that uh, the church received grace. We know you and I receive grace. <clears throat> it's, grace has been dispensed to us. But also, the other thing that Brother Jackson and I have talked a lot about, because he believes in these seven dispensations, is that information has been dispensed. And there are people like Clarence Larkin and Peter Ruckman and Jackson, uh, Mecca Wing Zero. Now, they believe that... Uh, there are seven periods of history where God dispensed more information. And and I don't see it that way necessarily. I don't see that you can divide it according to these seven different periods. Uh, but I do see that gradually through the, through the scriptures, as more scriptures were written down and the prophets revealing things, more knowledge about God and his plan was dispensed. So I see that dispensations is just a constant dispens dispensing of knowledge about God and the grace of God throughout history and now we have more knowledge than the people before the cross we have we have the benefit of all this knowledge that the people before the cross didn't necessarily have we know his name is Jesus we know that it is finished before the cross, they didn't know his name, and they certainly didn't think it was finished. They were looking forward to something being done for their salvation. So, to me, I see that there's only one division in the scriptures. We've got the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Old Covenant, the New Covenant. And I see that this knowledge and grace has been dispensed throughout history, and uh, and so that's what, to me, dispensation is. But people have taken dispensation and divided it up and overdone it and divided it in all these periods of history and sometimes placed different requirements on people and saying during that age they had to get saved this way during this next age they have to get saved another way then this age they had to get saved another way but I say no God was dispensing, dispensing more knowledge throughout history but people always got saved by faith in God and they, but they just really see more knowledge about who he is and what his plan was gradually. What is your reaction to that, brother? It's that's quite interesting to um, talk about the dispensing of more knowledge. Um, today we see people apparently having prophecies from the Lord and words from the Lord, etc. Like that. But I agree with it because in, we have one eyes in the one's past because um, we know we have the Bible for everything we need to know. And of course, it comes up, comes up, comes up with so-called prophecy to obviously check that with scripture to see if it lines up with scripture. Okay, amen. 
Okay, now, uh, so I see that the uh, uh, this idea of um, uh, dispensations is that uh, there's only there's only really uh, two periods instead of seven, uh, or some people divide it up even further. Uh, uh, but we got the Old Testament where people were receiving information about God and His plan, and, and looking forward to this fulfillment. And then the New Testament where we look back and say, okay, we God's dispensed all this information. Now we understand that what His plan was, and He's completed it. And all we got to do is trust Jesus. Uh, now the question is another question is in in Paul onlyism they believe there's more than one gospel and I believe there's one gospel not two some people believe there's many different gospels but I'm talking about the gospel for salvation the good news about how to get saved is there one gospel or is there two different gospels two different ways to get saved uh, and the the difference is, uh, they say that the gospel of the kingdom is different than the gospel of the grace of God. And we're going to study that out and see if the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God are two different gospels and two different ways to get saved for two different groups of people. For that, before I go into it, brother. Mm -hmm. So the, the question the question is um, is there more one more than one way to get saved grace for the church and kingdom for the Jews this is what Paul only is teach that uh, you and I brother Dean we get saved because of we're in the, we believe in Jesus as death, burial, and resurrection, and the, and the grace of God, and we're in the church. But the Jews, they had to get saved a different way, not in believing in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and not even being part of the church. But they believed in the gospel of the kingdom, which is the Jews believed that the Messiah would come and set up a kingdom, and he'd be the king over them. So that's the two different gospels that the uh, Paul onlyists are teaching. So we're going to figure out if there really are these two different Gospels or not. Let's first look at Luke 17, verse 20. Tell me when you've got it, okay, brother? Got it. Okay. It says, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Okay. How do you interpret that, brother? It's actually quite um, an interesting one. So it is. Um, the kingdom of God is within you. Uh, it's only first to me, like, but I've never really been really be able to explain it. You know, obviously the kingdom of God is obviously heaven as well. And there's the kingdom of God and heaven in two different places. I don't know if I'm being honest with you. <laughs> okay, that's a good question. And uh, for years, uh, I was taught, and I believed, and I taught other people, that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are two completely different things. The kingdom of God is spiritual. The kingdom of heaven uh, is a the millennial kingdom where Jesus is king over the world. Uh, so that that is the common that teaching. Uh, Dr. Ruckman teaches it. Clarence Larkin teaches it, and these hyper or Paul onlyists teach it too. But so first, let's look at verse Luke 17:20 and to try to understand better what this is talking about. They are asking him, Jesus, the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, and he says to them, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. So in other words, not with observation, what does that mean? You cannot see it, right? It's not a physical kingdom that you can see. You can't observe it. 
And you, in other words, you can't see, neither shall they say low here or low there. You know, in other words, they're not going to say, oh, the kingdom of God is over there across that border in that island, that particular location. That's where it is. No, it's not a physical place. It's not a physical kingdom. He says, the whole, behold, the kingdom of God is within you. It's, it's within each person, the believer. That's the kingdom of God. That's, and we, we're going to learn the, this is the spiritual kingdom. Now, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are used to be in the Gospels. This is where I found wrong in the past. Paul only is so wrong the way they see it. Uh, well, they think that the, uh, um, the kingdom is, um, anytime he word king, uses kingdom, it's referring to the Jews being, Jesus being king of the Jews. Okay, but uh, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are interchangeable terms. They mean exactly the same thing, contrary to what Dr. Ruckman and, and many others are teaching. Let's look at Matthew 10, 7 first. And as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then we go to Matthew 3, 1, 2. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So here we have here we have two parallel verses uh, that are saying inter using the true terms the exact same way, but and yet uh, one says kingdom of heaven. Uh, no, though I'm sorry, they both say kingdom of heaven. Okay, but now we go to Mark. That's in Matthew. In Matthew we see it says uh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand and then we look at Mark 1 verse 14 and 15. Just nod your head or something when you when you find it. Mark 1 verse 14 and 15. Okay. All right. It says now after John was put in prison Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So we have exactly the same term being used, except this time it says the kingdom of God, and in Matthew it says the kingdom of heaven. And now let's look at Mark, uh, Matthew 13, 24. Another parable he put forth to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Now we look at Mark. That last one was Matthew 13, 24. Let's look at Mark 4, 26 saying exactly the same thing, the same thing, but he says, and he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. So you can see in Matthew, it's the same parable, it's the same story, except in Matthew, he calls it the kingdom of heaven. In Mark, it's the same story, he's calling it the kingdom of God. But it's the same story. It's they're just using, their, it's used as an interchangeable term. Now we look at Matthew 19.23, and we're going to compare it to Mark 10.23. Matthew 19.23 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. But in Mark... The exact same account, it says, Mark 10, 23, Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, For enter the kingdom of God. And it also says this exact same thing in Luke 18, 24. So we have Jesus talking to the rich man, you know, saying it's, 
and how it's impossible and for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, the exact same story. And in, in one it calls it, it's called the kingdom of heaven, and other it's called the kingdom of God. Now let's look at uh, Matthew uh, 19, 14, and compare it to Mark 10, 14. Matthew 19, 14 says, But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Now we have Mark's version of it, Mark 10, 14. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. I hope everybody's getting the, the message that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are both used in exactly the same settings. One time it says heaven, the other time it says God. They cannot possibly be two different things, one spiritual, one physical. Now let's look at Matthew 13. Uh, the Matthew 13, the account of the parables, uh, all of Matthew 13, the account of the parables, the kingdom of heaven is like. So it says, uh, we'll look at Matthew 13, 31. A narrow parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. But we look at Mark, and it says, Then he said, To what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? So, uh, it's important to understand that when um, when Paul only us brother re refer to the gospel of the grace of God as your gospel and my gospel that we get saved by because now Paul's revealed the mystery we're saved by the grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone that was a mystery now we now we understand it it's been revealed to us and we get saved by the gospel the grace of God but no the other people the Jews back in Jesus's time and uh, Jews now they have to get saved when Jesus sets up his kingdom when he sets up his literal kingdom they have to have faith in the Messiah setting up his kingdom see you can see that the gospel of the kingdom is the same thing as the gospel of the grace of God. It's a spiritual kingdom. You, uh, you see, has I, have I made that point clear to, so that uh, you can see that how it's really? I don't see how anybody could refute that, brother. What's your response to that? Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Um, obviously, Jesus and kingdom of heaven's within you, so you must must be talking about that peace and love that you feel in your body when you when you sort of rest in the foundation of Christ. Obviously, being a spiritual place, but also being a physical place when you go, but a spiritual place still when you die. So, yeah, it makes pretty much sense to me. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. So um, now, uh, so what I want to make sure everybody understands is that uh, uh, the 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 Paul only is our teaching. That there's two gospels too, but the, the um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, John's epistles, Paul, Peter's epistles, all the other epistles, everything apart from Paul, they're not talking to us about salvation in the church. They're they're talking about the gospel of the kingdom to just the Jews. That's what they teach, and that's wrong. We just showed that the gospel of the kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. And uh, the gospel, the grace of God, is the same thing. So there's only one gospel, not two different gospels. The gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God are the same. Now, let's look at also the question of the body. Um, right now, we, we call the church the body of Christ. And uh, we... You know, I believe that uh, everybody who puts their faith in Jesus is in the body of Christ. Uh, but the Paul only is, say there's two bodies. Uh, one for the Gentiles uh, who believe in Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection, but a totally different body 
this they call the bride. They they think that the the Jews are not the body, but the the bride of Christ, and they they have that status by believing in the gospel of the kingdom. But no, we I'm going to show you from scriptures that no, there's not two different groups, two different bodies. There's there's only one. Let's look at first Galatians. 326 uh, 27-28 uh, let me know when you, you have that brother nod your head okay it says Paul says for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know how it's impossible to come to any other conclusion than, than what Paul is stating here. How is it possible that a Paul only, is, after reading this, could think that they're, these Jews are in a totally different group that they're not one when it says here that there is neither Jew nor Greek. Brother, would you respond to that? Um, yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, it kind of says it all one in Christ Jesus. And if you read verse 29 as well, it says, um, And if you be in Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise? It doesn't really say about being a separate boy and a separate bride. It just says we're all one in Christ Jesus, so we're all in one body. Mm-hmm. Uh, amen. I'm I'm glad you I'm glad you added that verse. Uh, I considered putting that verse in with my my notes here, but that that brings up another subject, and that is who is Israel, and uh, uh, that verse is telling us there that whole section of writing, and it's telling us that um, uh, it, it, the Israel is not people who were born as Jews. Those people are not real Israel. Real Israel is any Jew or Gentile who believes in Jesus, and they're into then they're part of Abraham's promise. So I'm glad you added that because that that is a very important point too. Uh, in fact, if you read all of Galatians chapter three, that's really what this is all about. Everybody, this is, this is almost like Paul wrote this just to tell all the Paul only us, hey, you're wrong. There's there's not two groups. There's not the Jews have one body and the Gentile believers have a different body. The the Gentiles have one gospel. The Jews have a different gospel. No. Paul is, is writing all of Galatians chapter three to tell them there's one body, Jew and Greek, it doesn't matter. We all have the same gospel, the same um, salvation. So read Galatians chapter 3. Now, now let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 13. Uh, let me know when you have that, brother. Okay. Okay. Uh, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. So we have him in Corinthians uh, addressing the same thing. What, uh, apparently, I don't, think, I don't think the Apostle Paul was like a, a person who was like mindlessly just writing things for no particular reason. I think everything he wrote was because there was a need to write it. Why did he keep repeating that the Jews and the Greeks are, no, oh, you're all united together under one body, under one spirit? Why did he have to keep on saying that? Brother, I think it's because people were saying that they were separate, they're different, they have different ways. And that's what the Paul Onlyists are saying today. Paul needed to address it. And correct them, just like I'm trying to address and correct the Paul Onlyists today. Paul Onlyists are saying that the Jews, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all the writings other than Paul's writings, that's for 
a different group of believers who believe in a different gospel. And But Paul's saying here in Corinthians and in Galatians, he's saying, no, Jew and Greek are the same. Uh, we'll look next at uh, Ephesians 4.4. 4. So, uh, there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So it's uh, here we see it. We see it in Galatians, we see it in Corinthians, we see it in Ephesians, and now let's look at Romans 10, 9 through 13. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall be not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we got Galatians, Corinthians, Ephesians, Romans, Paul is making the same point over and over. There is no difference between the Jewish believer, the Greek gospel, one baptism, one faith, one spirit. Over and over again, he's making this point. And how is it possible for these Paul only to be confused on this and teaching that there's no, there's a difference, that the other writings apply to Jews who have a different message, a different way of salvation. He's saying, no, the Jews are the same. It's the same message. Let's look at Ephesians 3.6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and of the partakers of the promise of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So he's saying here that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body. That's the Gentile of the same body. Well, who are these the same with? Obviously, anybody who's not a Gentile is a Jew because there's only two distinctions in the scripture. You have Jews and non-Jews. If you're a non-Jew, you're referred to as a Gentile. So it says that the Gentiles, the non-Jews, should be fellow heirs. Fellow heirs with who? Who's different than the Gentiles? Only Jews are different than the Gentiles. So the Gentiles and the Jews are fellow heirs, the same body. John, finally, let's look at John. Uh, uh, this is this is not even Pauline. J John 10, verse 16. Let me know when you have that, brother. Okay. Uh, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Now, this is Jesus speaking. This is before the death, burial, and resurrection. And Jesus is saying there, prophetically, that uh, he has other sheep. He's talking in the beginning about how his message is just for the Jews, but here he's telling us, no, he has other sheep too that are not of this fold, that are not Jewish, and they will, uh, them also must I bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold. So Jesus is prophetically claiming, proclaiming here that there's going, there's another group that's going to be included, and uh, that's he's alluding to it. All right, brother, uh, uh, I'm going to pick up next uh, next study with the question: Was Paul the exclusive apostle to the Gentiles? Uh, because Paul only us want to talk, proclaim that. Uh, on not only everything we discussed so far today, but uh, they they claim that Paul was the only apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, so that's where we're going to pick up next time. <clears throat> but first, <clears throat> I want to uh, make some conclusions for today's study, <clears throat> and then also uh, uh, invite people to uh, uh, get born again.
so, brother, I appreciate you joining me uh, in this conversation. I guess you you made the second half. Uh, maybe if you have time, you can go back and watch it from the beginnings and get caught up on what you might have missed. But uh, uh, what's your? Is there anything that was discussed today that was maybe new to you? And uh, have you experienced, you know Brother Greg, and I call him brother because I made the point in the very beginning, that the Paul Onlyists are Christians. They're not like some people that are, are, are cultists and, and they're, they're heretics and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, not, even, not even saints. So, yeah, they're saints. They're Christians. I'm not challenging that at all. I love them. I'd love to have fellowship with them. If they would stop trying to impose Paul onlyism on everybody, stop trying to correct me and everybody else every time we quote John 3.16 and say, you can't do that. Only quote what Paul said. Well, see, that's what I'm coming out against. I'm trying to defend Jesus, John, and Peter, the other writings that are good for our salvation. And so... Uh, uh, first of all, tell me if you've had any experience dealing with the Paul Onlyists, and if, if you've had the same kind of reaction that I've had, that even though they're saints, they're trying to impose Paul Onlyism on others, and uh, have you learned anything new from this study, brother? Um, I'm going to be honest with you, I have had no encounter, like hostile encounter with um, Paul in this weapons. but yeah, I mean, what I've learned today, I mean, it's pretty interesting stuff. I was actually starting this way towards the right divider, the right division thingy, so it wasn't myself, but this story has been quite good and informative, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, t I'll tell you, the best way to have no confrontation with them is to never quote John 3.16 in any of your messages. Uh, never quote anything apart from Paul, and you're going to get along fine with them. But as soon as you start quoting, uh, you know, the Gospel of John or Jesus' words, and, and, and we're talking about salvation, you're going to find out how they immediately want to correct you and say, "You can't do that, brother Dean. You can only Paul's our apostle. You can't. You, know, you don't get saved by Jesus or by uh, by uh, John, the Gospel of John. You have to go get saved through Paul. That's their. That's what their problem is. So. Uh, I, I'm not saying they're hostile, but they're very anxious to correct anybody who is teaching that you can get saved from the Gospel of John or Jesus' own words. Uh, all right, brother, uh, let's tell the people who are watching now how to get saved, because some of these people watching uh, uh, may be new to uh, the Bible, and maybe they think that Christianity is a religion, and uh, you got to join the religion and become a religious person and follow all kinds of religious rules and change your life around and, and then keep your fingers crossed, hoping you're good enough and you can go to heaven. Is is that what is that what we're asking them to do, brother, or is it something different? Yeah, it's something different. Unfortunately, no matter how hard you try, your good works will never be good enough. As far as scripture has concluded, all all sinned. And fall short of the glory of, glory, glory of God. It also included that all our righteousness are as filthy rags. But luckily, God manifested Himself in the flesh and came, in, came on the earth as Jesus and died for your sins and rose in the, was buried and rose on the third day. He also says um, in John chapter 5, verse um, 24, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me have everlasting life, but shall not come into condemnation. While it's passed from death unto life. So just put your faith in God's plan of salvation, which is Christ died according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. Put your trust in that and that alone, and you'll have eternal life. Amen. Thank you, brother. That was very well said. And some people might be thinking, well, gee, I mean, could it really be that simple? I mean, you're telling me all I got to do is is believe that Jesus died for my sins and, and he'll give me eternal life if I put my faith in him. Could, could it really be that simple? That sounds too easy. Well, see, the problem is people think of Christianity as a religion, like the other religions of the world. Like in Islam, they have these five pillars of Islam. You've got to do these five things. You've got to pray 
five times a day on a rug. You got to make a trip to Mecca someday. There's all list of things. You got to do this and this and this and this. And in Roman Catholicism, they have seven sacraments, and you got to do all these things. And it's it's all these religious activities and things you've got to accomplish. And, and then you got to cross your fingers, hoping that you did it well enough, and God's satisfied, and maybe you get to go to heaven. But that's religion. But we're, what we're talking today is is not about religion. We're talking about Jesus Christ, believing in this person. We're not asking you to put your faith in any religion. We're not asking you to become religious. We're asking you to believe that Jesus has the power to give you everlasting life and put your faith in him completely. And, and he can do it because he is God Almighty, as you said. He's God manifest in the flesh. And your ability to, to stop sinning and all your past sins, that's irrelevant because the scriptures tell us Jesus died for our sins. So he paid for all our sins. You need to understand and believe that. Now, the reason we have confidence in Jesus is because of the resurrection. When he raised himself from the dead, he proved that he is God. He has the power of life and death. So that gives me confidence to say, okay, I believe Jesus does have this power. He promises eternal life if I put my faith in him. So I, Brother Luke, I put my faith in Jesus, and we're just asking you to do the same thing. Don't put your faith in yourself. Don't put your faith in your ability to be religious. Instead, put all your faith in the Savior. Is that it, brother? Any, any final remarks before we say goodbye to the audience? No. You find that you, had, you said yourself, you don't have to do anything else. Nothing else is required but just belief in the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's it. Mm -hmm. All right, brother. Thank you for joining me. Uh, I'll, I'm going to end the live broadcast, but the last thing I want to ever tell you and everybody else is that once we put our faith in Jesus, then I, I hope that you can just learn to rest, rest in the love and grace of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.